A very warm welcome to the 2018 Clifford Patterson Lecture. I'm Ulrike Tillmann and one of the Vice Presidents of the Royal Society. It is really my great pleasure to host this evening's lecture by Professor Timothy Layton. As you can see later, maybe, this is uh, supported by live speech to text. The Clifford Patterson Lecture is given every two years by an outstanding researcher in the field of engineering. The lectureship was originally endowed by the General Electric Company in memory of Clifford Patterson, a fellow of the society who founded the GEC research laboratories nearly 100 years ago in 1919. The first lecture was given in 1975. The lecture is really a prize lecture in two, uh, the 2018 Clifford Patterson Medal and Lecture was awarded to Professor Tim Nathan. And I quote from the citation for translation of his fundamental research into acoustics and his application in many areas, including antimicrobial resistance, mine detection, fetal scanning, catastrophe relief, climate change, and marine life. Professor Layton has had an outstanding career. He got his BA in 85 from Cambridge, and three years later from the, his PhD from the Cavendish Lab, had a couple of uh, research fellowships in Cambridge, and then in 1992 moved to Southampton University, where he has been ever since. He's a fellow of no less than three of the four UK national academies and has received many honors for his work. Indeed, this is not the first award from the Royal Society. In 2011, he received the Royal Society Brian Mercer Award for Innovation for the device Star Stream that uses ultrasound and bubbles to enhance the cleaning power of a stream of water. I assume we hear probably later from more about this. It is also not his first award named after Clifford Patterson. Already in 2006, he received the Patterson Medal of the Institute of Physics. I will not list all his awards, uh, as this will take too much of our valuable time tonight. But uh, as there are many younger people here uh, in the audience, let me just mention that many students will know Professor Leighton's um, name from his very widely read book, The Acoustic Bubble which leads us straight into the evening's lecture, the title of which, of course, is The Bubble, the Acoustic Bubble, Climate Change, Spaceships, Dolphins, and the Antibiotic Apocalypse. So I present. Thank you very much, Ulrika, for that very kind introduction. Uh, can we flick to the first slide, please? <laughs> okay. Now. Can you hear that sound? It's the sound of a dripping tap. And uh, we're familiar with the uh, visuals of a dripping tap, um, as I'm going to play here. This is a milk drop falling into a cup of coffee. And as the drop comes in, um, you can see it fall. It produces this crown shape, and underneath the water, a kind of bowl-shaped crater. And as that crater closes, up comes pretty much the same drop of milk that went in. And if you wish to be a cool scientist at parties, then when somebody says you want your coffee black or white, you say uh, white, and as that first drop comes out of it, and you catch it and say black. Change my mind. <laughs> Now, the, dr the plink sound you heard has nothing to do with the visuals you just saw. And I can prove that with this um, picture here, which shows a drop of, yeah. drop of water falling through air into some water. And in the water, I've placed this, an underwater microphone, also called a hydrophone. And the signal from the hydrophone is shown here. And as I play the movie, a vertical line will move across here to keep in track with where we are in the uh, hydrophone signal. And the plink of a dripping tap is this thing here. This little thing here is not acoustic. It's uh, another kind of pressure waveform. It's not really very significant. 
So what you'll be able to see is what signal on the image corresponds to the plinker for dripping tap. So here we go, the drop falls, produces that crater, and in about five seconds, you'll see what causes the plinker for dripping tap. Now watch the base of the crater. Three, two, one, plink. That tiny little bubble causes the, drip, the plink of a dripping tap. So every time you see a bubble formed, you get a plink followed by a silence. There's the plink followed by the silence. And then pitch of that plink, the note, um, depends on the size of the bubble. Big bubbles give out low notes, blunk, 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 as if you hear a scuba diver breathing out bubbles. And small bubbles, blink, 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 like in a dripping tap, give, they give out high notes. <clears throat> I can prove it's that powerful because here I got a bottle of water and I filled it underwater in the bath. And when I shake it, you can't hear anything. Now, as I get thirsty, I'll pour some of this and then I'll shake it again when it's got a bit of air in and you'll hear the difference. Right, so plink plus silence tells you a bubble's been burst and it also tells you the size of that bubble. Now, we're interested in that in the oceans. Here's a leak on the seabed. It might be from a ruptured gas pipeline. It might be from methane seep, uh, coming up from the seabed. And if we listen to the signal from that, it looks like this. And what it is, that's a lot of those little plinks all overlapping. And it's very hard to see a plink followed by silence in that and therefore get the note. But, all, but we can uh, work out the maths of how this note is formed. And you take that maths give it to a computer, and we tell the computer to look at that signal and analyze it the same way, listening to the notes. Now, I'm not going to go through that math because you know it already. All those equations are in your head. <laughs> no, they are. Listen, I'm going to play this, and at the end of it, you'll tell me, like I'm asking the computer to tell me, many little bubbles were formed and then one big one at the end. Listen. Uh. You hear? So you've got all that. So I work with people, uh, John Bull and Paul White are in the audience, and we are using that to build sensors, and hopefully this year, next year, there'll be a place on the base of the North Sea to look at leaks of bubbles from uh, carbon capture and storage facilities. These are exhausted oil fields where um, we're taking uh, uh, carbon dioxide from the atmosphere and pumping it down into the seabed to remove it from the uh, atmosphere to mitigate against uh, climate change. And we don't want them to leak, so we've got sensors based on this technique to um, check for leaks. Now, once you've got those equations, you don't have to stop with Earth. This is uh, Saturn. And this dot above it is Titan, Saturn's largest moon. Titan is a beautiful place, really. Um, it's got this purple haze around it, and that's because it's got a thick atmosphere. It's rather like the atmosphere here. It's about one and a half times as uh, atmospheric pressure that we have here. It's mainly nitrogen, a bit of cyanide, very cold, uh, minus 180 degrees C, which is why it hasn't boiled off as it would if it was um, circling Earth because it's very far from the sun. Now, people couldn't see the surface of, Huygen, of, of, of Titan. However, some people um, theorize that it's a very interesting place. For one thing, it might have um, waterfalls and lakes, not made of water, because that would freeze, but made of liquid ethane and methane, but couldn't see it beneath this purple smog. So uh, the European Space Agency made this probe, Huygens, and Huygens, it looks a bit like a wok. And it sat on the side of this huge spacecraft um, Cassini built by NASA, and it took seven years to get them. And after seven years, the WOC, Huygens, detached from the side of Cassini and parachuted through this atmosphere so we could see this surface. And we, you know, we were very interested, not there, particularly some of us, we were very interested to know if there might be streams and waterfalls and lakes there made of liquid ethane and methane. Now, at the time, a lot of probes were crashing into Mars and just breaking up. And one thing I wondered was if we had, um, we, we equip all these probes with wonderful cameras so that we can see places. Uh, in fact, that's, that's been NASA's business model for, for, for 40 years, is to say, let's go and explore such and such a place. We might find life. There's possibly the, possibly the life, 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 life. Resident signs off on it. They see no life, but they say, but look at the pictures. The pictures were wonderful. <laughs> And, and so it's been a pic life pictures, life pictures sort of business model. And I say, cameras break. Um, and if we had a, a microphone, microphones are tough, just if, if the last thing we hear from this microphone as it crashes into that world is a splash and not a crunch, 
we know we've discovered the first lake open to the atmosphere anywhere apart from Earth. But that presupposes one thing, and that is that a lake, a splash in a lake, made of liquid ethane and methane at 180 degrees below zero, would be recognisable. Because your brains have been programmed. Do you remember that thing we heard? Those equa that's, but your brains have been programmed for air, water, room temperature. So the question is, can we take that mass and put it in the conditions of Titan and work out what a splash would sound at and see whether we would have recognised it? So um, I'm going to play, this is a BBC movie, and, I'm gonna, and it shows, um, here is uh, Huygens parachuting through the atmosphere, and at the moment of splash, this is an animation of what might have happened, um, take, done before the actual splashdown, I'm going to play the sound of the splash we calculated. It's perfectly recognisable. Now, as it happens, um, when Huygens landed, it looked like this. It just sat there looking out over this snowy, muddy field. But imagine it might have had its back to some methane fall, this wonderful waterfall made of liquid. And it would never know, because the camera sits like that. Had it had a microphone, it could have heard this waterfall. But again, that presupposes that when we heard what was on the microphone signal, we would have recognized it a waterfall. So again, we worked out the sound of a waterfall on Titan. Perfectly recognizable. Now, as it happens, Huygens missed the waterfalls, and it missed, if they were, uh, it missed the uh, lakes. But Titan does have a lake, so if ever, um, if ever we go back there, we might aim to hit a lake. Now, you'll see this as being a, um, a theme in my work. Uh, tell people things that are completely unprovable until at least I'm dead. <laughs> <laughs> It'll take ages to get back there. Right, let's get back. Now, the, mass, the real place on Earth where loads and loads of bubbles are made is, is the ocean, billions. And what we can see here, this is the atmosphere, this is a photo I took, that's the sea surface, and underneath the sea surface you see these clouds of microscopic bubbles, and waves are breaking and they're pushing in to the ocean, and then some of them are going down and some are being pulled up because the ocean, ocean is turbulent. And this is the ocean's breathing. So about 1,000 million tonnes of atmospheric carbon every year transfers between the atmosphere and the oceans. But we don't really know how much. And to know how much, we'd like to count the bubbles. We'd like to count the bubbles and know how much dissolves into the ocean. So an ocean wave might break. And as it does so, it traps the atmospheric air. And at the point where it traps it, of course, those bubbles are going to give out a plink. So we can count the number of bubbles and their size by listening to the sounds of those plinks, just as we showed. The problem is, those bubbles then are silent, as some rise to the surface and some are pushed under buoyancy and dissolve. And we don't know how much dissolved, unless we have a second count sometime later. But we can't count them by listening to them because they're silent. So the way we get them, like little, you remember I said those bubbles are like little bells, gongs. Well, if I take you blindfolded into a room and I tell you there may be bells in this room or not, you're not allowed to uh, do anything except talk to me, and you start talking, you may know there are bells there if you listen for them humming back at you. If you hit the right notes, the bells will hum. If you go up to a grand piano and you press the sustaining pedal and you shout at it, or you shout at a guitar, the strings will hum back at you. Therefore, so we set out, we decided to make the second count of how many bubbles are, uh, are still around sometime later, and from the, distant, from the difference between those two counts, get how much carbon dioxide is dissolved, by sending sonar pings into the water. So we got a couple of boys, and we got an underwater loudspeaker, and it sent sonar pings, and so we count the some number of bubbles remaining sometime later. I'm going to play the sounds here, so you can hear the difference. These are sonar pings in bubble-free water. And now the same pings after a wave has passed and generated bubbles. Do you hear the difference? So the comp we give the computer the equations of that, and it can calculate the, uh, the difference. I'll just shake this now, just to prove. See what a difference a little bit of bubbles makes. Right. So we put These that information. We put the information into a model. So this is an area that models the ocean uh, bed. It's, sorry, the top of the ocean. It's the top 15 meters of the ocean in a footprint measuring about 60 meters by 100. Sorry, 100 meters by 100 meters. 
And these are the bubbles trapped by breaking waves. And they're color-coded, so the small bubbles are blue. They're 25 microns in radius. And the bigger bubbles, 250 microns in radius, they're red. And as we run this, we'll see the turbulence spreading these bubbles. And you'll see that the red bubbles tend to stick close to the surface because big bubbles rise more under buoyancy. And so as this runs, we keep track of where all the, all the carbon dioxide is. And we keep a count of that. And that will then tell us how much carbon dioxide is dissolving into the oceans through, uh, through this uh, injection effect. You see towards the end, the, the, these bubble clouds form sort of Y-shaped things. It's called uh, from a phenomenon called Langmuir circulation. It's very beautiful. I can't, I can't leave you without actually showing you the experiment. Uh, so here we go. Watch out! Bloody hell. <laughs> OK. Now, the masters of the bubbles and acoustics are the humpback whales. So um, here's uh, two of them, more than two, uh, doing something called bubble netting. So what happens is one whale or more dives deep and swims in a spiral pattern, blowing bubbles from their blowhole, and they generate this bubble net. And what happens is they trap creatures inside it, and then the whales come up from below with their mouths open, and they swallow them all. And this is called um, uh, bubble netting, and it's been known about for years and years and years, but the problem with it is... Why would the fish not swim through the bubbly water? We know salmon swim up waterfalls. What would scare them off? There's a missing ingredient. Um, here's a BBC video of it happening. So when I saw pictures like that, I thought the missing ingredient is sound, because it's not about these two whales here. It's about this one here. Because if this one sends sound into this net, it'll bounce off those bubbles and be trapped and produce a wall of sound. Let's just take this, consider this bit of quarter of a bubble net there. If this is a sound wavefront coming out, and it's about to hit that net, the top will be in the bubbly water, and the bottom won't. Therefore, the top will be travelling slower. So if this goes slow and this goes fast, the sound will turn into the net. It'll pass through the net. And at this point, this will be slow, this will be fast. And it'll turn back. And so the sound will be trapped in the net. So that was the theory. So, and uh, I've got an animation here. The sound is quite loud here. This is a real bubble, bubble whale call. Um, <laughs> Now, whales only make that call at this moment. Uh, it's, it's, it, it's not made by them at any other time. It's, it's the top of their register, and it's extremely loud. So that's been an explanation for what it's for. And my theory was it might be to make the sound do that. Because then you have a wall of sound. And anything trapped in this doesn't just see a bubble wall to pass. It sees a wall of sound, very intense sound, at the frequencies that will resonate swim bladders, which is something that fish have. And if you beyond a certain age, resonating your bladder is just a very uncomfortable thing to do. <laughs> so we did a computer model of this net. And sure enough, if this whale sends sound in, uh, this gray curve is the net. And here you can see the sound waves bounce around and they, whatever they do, they form a very quiet point here. And that's the point where the whales come up every time. Therefore, we have an explanation. And it's a bit like Titan. Who's going to swim through this with a microphone and try and prove me wrong? But it's a good story. Uh, you know, it now features on whale watching tours when it happens. And that made sense to me. What made absolutely no sense to me at all when I saw it was this BBC clip of dolphins doing a similar thing. Here they go. They're being released by the dolphins, working together in teams. They use the bubbles to corral the sardines into ever tighter groups. That made no sense, because the signal the dolphins are sending out is very different, and it's for a very different purpose. This is the sound of it. They're sending out short clicks, because if I send out a click and it bounces off 
or the car, and it comes back to me, then for the time delay, I know how far she is. And so I can start doing that and forming pictures using sound, sonar, of what's out there. And key to that is the scattering, the bouncing off the target, bouncing off Ulrika there. And the problem is, by blowing bubbles like that, one bubble is far more powerful a scatterer at the right frequencies than the fish. So what the, when it's hunting, by blowing bubbles, it's taking a field that contains the fish that it wants, and it's filling it with clutter, scatterers that are more strongly scattering. It's blinding and confusing itself. It's making fog so that it can't hunt. And we know it, and you're going to say to me, ah, do dolphins have great sonar? They don't. Dolphins have great sonar capability. What they can do with it is very good, but the sonar itself, if you take a dolphin and you compare it to the best man-made sonar in terms of the frequencies and the power and all that stuff, it's mediocre. It's not nearly as good as the best man-made sonar. But the best man-made sonar couldn't find the fish in that bubble cloud. Um, and we know that because here is, sorry, there is a picture there. Inside there, we've actually got a weightlifter's weight, a big metal weight uh, somewhere within, uh, this is distance here, and it's within two meters of the sonar source, man-made sonar source, and you can't see where it is. What you're hoping is some picture like this, but all you've got is clutter. So the best man-made source can't find it, so what does the dolphin have in addition? Well, it's able to move around, it's able to look at a source from many directions, but it's also got a brain that's been trying to figure this out for 20 million years. So is it all in the brain? The sonar signal, the pings may be weak, but the processing is good in the brain. So I said, okay, let's say I was the dolphin and I'm trying to figure out what pulse would I make that would get over this problem. And the pulse that I came up with is something like this. It's a click, followed by a click that's smaller. And that's all it is. And as so long as the two clicks are identical, but one is a known fraction of the size of the other, then it's possible to see the fish in the bubble cloud. Um, so let's see how that works. Right, this signal, this is a Greek letter, and this Greek letter is what I'm going to call the signal. And uh, so the fish is going to, the dolphin's going to send out a sonar signal, click, click. And it's going to get back an echo from a fish of click, click, or the could be in the fish. But the rest of you are bubbles. So I'm just going to get a whole lot of a crack, crack from the rest of you. So I'm not going to be able to see the fish. But the echo from the bubble, because the bubble isn't sitting there like a fish, it wobbles like this. It comes back, the echo is what went out squared. Because the wall is wobbling. And that means that, let's say, let's assume the dolphin does a quick calculation. It sends out click, click. It listens to the, the echoes, and then he starts doing some calculates. It takes twice the second echo, and it adds it to the first echo. So that is two times a half, the second echo. Add to the first echo, one, which is one plus one is two. So he gets a strong signal from the fish. But he gets quite a strong signal from the bubble. Two times a half squared plus one squared is one and a half. So again, you can't see the difference between the fish and the bubble. But then it takes the memories of those clicks and it now subtracts them. So it takes the first echo minus two times the second echo. And the scatter from the fish goes one minus two times a half, which is one times one is zero. You get nothing from the fish. The fish goes invisible when you subtract your memories. And the bubbles never do. One squared minus two times a half squared is a half. So the bubbles don't go invisible, which means if you go click, click, you take the memories and you add and subtract them, and there's a fish in there, then when you switch between addition and subtraction, the fish flickers like that, and you find it. You find it because when you subtract, it will go invisible, and that's how you find the fish. So I thought, it should work. And in fact, when we apply it to exactly the same data here, you can find the weightlifter weight. So it does kind of work. There's no proof that dolphins do it. But if you actually listen to that click they do, listen carefully, the clicks aren't all the same amplitude. They tend to go click, 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 click. And it might just them being careless, and I might just be having wishful thinking, but listen to it again. So maybe 
But who can get in? A, who can prove me wrong? You've got to get in Elfin's brain. So it's, okay. So we made, anyway, made a man-made sonar, and it actually works. And uh, this is important because um, uh, in the uh, Gulf War here, you can see in uh, you've got all this bubbles and mud down here from the Tigris, the Euphrates, and the coastal thing. And in here, you can't find you can't find mines. There's a lot of sea mines were planted there in the in the Gulf War. Couldn't be found. Um, the only way to find it is divers going out there with their fingers and dolphins. And to be honest, the dolphins died of a bacterial infection. So it's just men with fingers. That's all they've got. And therefore, this um, sonar is now getting um, in production. It's valuable. You know, it's an important problem. The three ships, including the Tripoli, were damaged. Um, loss of life plus $3.6 million worth of damage for a sea mine that costs you $1,500. And you don't even have to have... A mine. You just have to make the person think, and you stop all the convoys, all the military operations, all the humanitarian aid, all the trade. Everything stops because there might be a mine there and you can't see it. So um, a sonar like this is important. However, when I wrote the equations for this, I did have another trick at the back of my mind, and it was that the equations don't care that this is sound. It just has to be a waveform. So let's make a radar works on the same way, because here you've got a couple of soldiers doing pretty much the same thing that a, a, a dolphin was trying to do. They're trying to find this thing. It's a, a trigger for an uh, IED, an improvised explosive device. Now, you can improvise explosive device, nasty devices, bombs, uh, and you can look for them with radar, ground penetrating radar, metal detectors, so the people making them get as much metal out of them as they can. In fact, that's the last bit of metal you can't get rid of. It's the trigger. It's about an inch long and weighs about two grams. Very hard to find. Um, however, if you equip your radar, uh, and I did this in collaboration with good friends at, at UCL here, if you equip your radar um, with this two pulse technique, you might be able to find it. So, um, uh, we, uh, here we go. We took a load of devices, uh, mobile phones, bench clamps, and a huge metal plate and buried them and started looking for them. And if we map the signals from them, you can see that uh, one of those signals is red. That means it's 30 dB. That's a thousand times more strong a scatterer than all the others. And which one was that? It was the trigger, because we tuned it to find that kind of object. And what we'd like to do where if ever we turn to this again, it, 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 it's tuning to find mobile phones. Because you should be able to find a mobile phone, whether your batteries are in it or not, whether it's turned on or not, whether you've driven a car over it a few times or not. Finding a mobile phone would be valuable. If this building collapsed, we wouldn't find you with radar because you're just bags of water. But you've each got a mobile phone. And if we can make the phone up mobile phone scatter a thousand times more strongly, then all the other uh, girders and cavity ties and all the rest of the bits of metal, and we can find you. Okay. Now, while I was working on this, we get to... I kept this little bubble playing around at the bottom, very well behaved. Um, and so we get to the last part of the story, which is to revisit the um, ultrasonic cleaning, or we can mention the Starstream device. So if you want to clean things, there are a number of ways. There is an ultrasonic cleaning bath. They've been around for 50 years or so. Um, they're great. They have a number of problems. You can only fit something in it that's small enough to fit in it. And anything you do put in it sits in a soup of its own muck, so you can cross-contaminate, which is important if you're dealing with infections. Uh, jet pressure washers, jet washers, they're great. Um, you can build one that can cut through metal, but they damage stuff um, if you build them powerfully enough. And, you know, you wouldn't clean a sewage line with one because they make a lot of spray that contaminate. So the question is, these things, one, is in a, one has the convenience of a stream of water, but you can't use it in some circumstances, and one has an ultrasonic capability, but you really can't use it. The other problem with the ultrasonics is that it works, it doesn't do a gentle bubble dance like this. The, what happens is the bubble tries to collapse, and if it's against a solid surface, as it tries to collapse, the uh, bottom can't move. There's no flow from the bottom because there's a solid in the way. But the flow is from the top, so a liquid jet comes to the top and punches the base, uh, the solid. And that means you get damaging. That's half a survival blanket that's been dipped in. You can see which half has. 
So I wanted to build a device that was a gentle cleaner using bubbles, stimulating bubbles, not to collapse like jets, but to wiggle like that and put it in a stream, but not a, a damaging stream, a gentle trickle of water like you get if you just turn your tap just on. So, um, and the test would be cleaning salad. Salad here. Uh, this is some um, uh, basil. It's ready to eat from the supermarket. It's from a ready to eat bag. And if you uh, wash it for a minute in cold water and put it under the microscope, so, then you can see this uh, bacteria. It's E. coli, it's probably from animal feces. Um, that's ready to eat. And if we, <laughs> if, we, if we clean it for a minute instead of this cold water, but with our device, you can see that it's, it's clean, but also it's not damaged. If we had to put that under, if, we, if you put basil in front of this or this, it, 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 it turns into basil soup. Um, okay, so that was the ambition. And it's important, people get sick and die of E. coli. So um, here we have a bubble, and we can take that bubble and we hit it with ultrasound and we make it dance like this. And it's shimmering. And because it's shimmering, it starts scrubbing away at things nearby. You get flow, you get shear. Uh, if you do this with your hands and it, your neighbours there, you'll tickle them. Um, so it's, it can clean, providing it's close. But the other thing it's doing is it's not floating away. And that's because I'm holding it still using the sound automatically. This is how it works. Um, the sound comes in, hits the bubble, bounces off the wall we want to clean, bounces off the wall we want to clean, hits the bubble again, and so the bubble is attracted to the wall. And that explanation makes no sense to you because you're not bubbles, you're, you're people. And people work by visual sight. So let's make this a visual analogy. Light comes in, hits my face, bounces off my face, hits a reflective wall, comes off the reflective wall, hits my face again. We call that looking in a mirror. So in sound terms, in the world of sound, the bubble sees a, a mirror, a twin image, the other side of the wall. Two bubbles doing exactly the same thing attract. So the bubble is attracted to the wall. But the thing that we really want to clean up are crevices and cracks like this. Because we can clean the flat surfaces with wipes and brushes. We can't get in the crevices and the cracks. And these bubbles will find those crevices and cracks automatically. Because if you look into two mirrors like that, you don't see one twin. You see many mirror images. And so if we have a crevice and a clack, the bubble sees many mirror bubbles, and so we're strongly attracted to it. We prove it here with this little um, video. So what we have here is some plastic, and inside the plastic we've drilled a hole that's about the thickness of a medium-sized human hair. That's that clear cylinder there. Um, on the top we've put a sticky contaminant, and it's dark on the top. It also fills the hole, but it doesn't look black in the hole, because we're only looking through the thickness of a human hair of it. But we know it's there, because this black thing at the bottom is actually a sensor that tells us um, whether this is clean or dirty. Whether it's clean or dirty at that point, and you can see at the start, it says dirty. I'm going to run this, and you'll see very quickly the top is cleaned away, and then the bubbles find that crevice. And when they find it, they'll burrow in it, cleaning. And if you look carefully, their edges will be wiggling as they clean away. And the moment they hit the bottom is the moment that it suddenly goes clean. So here we go. And top surface gets clean now. And the bubble's about to find. Here you go, there's the bubbles. And they're wiggling, and they're about to get to the bottom. And so it goes. And they've cleaned it. So we've cleaned those difficult to find places automatically. So that was developed in a device here called Starstream, which works as shown in this animation. So water comes up a little tube like this, fills this cone here, comes out. We make sound waves at the back, which propagate down this stream of water. And then here we have little bubbles generated. And they go to the surface where they start wiggling and cleaning, like that. And you can see the effectiveness of it uh, here. This is an old piece of uh, porous tile with old soot work. And I'm passing water down it with no ultrasound. And after 5, 4, 3, 2, 1, I'm going to turn on the ultrasound and the bubbles. And you see it cleans the soot away. So it's very good at cleaning this soot. There's no chemicals here. It's just water and air and sound. That's all you need. OK. And so let's try cleaning teeth with it. One third of the world's population suffers from untreated tooth decay. That's very bad. So we got some sheets of glass, and they, were, they had little castellations on, like this. And we covered them in three types of dental bacteria here. That's before, 
That's washing with water, and you can see it's cleaned the top here, but not the crevice, not the grooves, not cleaned, not cleaned. Now we try to clean with Starstream, just cool water, no additives, and it cleans well, and it cleans well on, on teeth well. Here we've stained the bacteria purple. Um, this is mouse brain. Uh, we're interested in mouse brain on surgical steel because brain matter, matter is, is how mad cow disease, CJD, is passed if, if it's not uh, cleaned. And surgical steel is used, it's quite, it's quite things attached to it. So uh, we were interested in cleaning surgical steel. So this is a mouse brain in orange on surgical steel uh, before cleaning, and that's what happens if you wash in water for five seconds. Uh, this is a second sample, and now we wash for five seconds in Starstream. And it cleans it. And that's so successful, in fact, that, that we're putting that in. Um, it's going to be piloted in up to 24 hospitals um, by our team uh, over the next couple of years. Uh, I'll credit the team on the last slide. Don't, team members, don't feel you're being ignored. <laughs> we'll get there in the end. Uh, okay, now this is an interesting one. This is a pig trotter. Uh, the pig is dead. That's important, remember that. That yellow slime is a thing called Pseudomonas. Pseudomonas is a super drug. It's multi-drug multi, multi, multi resistant pathogen. So it's hard to treat. And here it is growing slimy in a wound. Uh, it's on many of our hands. You know, the problem is it's passed from hand to hand. And if it gets past the skin barrier via a wound or perhaps the eyes or something like that, then it can cause affection, hospital-acquired infection, for example. In the USA, that causes 2 million patients affected, 90,000 deaths, many tens of billions of dollars lost from hospital-acquired affections. So my team, and here I have to give my team credit, credit because uh, I don't go near this slime. <laughs> Look under the microscope beforehand, and there's the green stuff. That's the, that's the pseudomonas here. Here it is in what we call a biofilm. That's a sticky mat that's quite hard to clean. And that's the control. That's the one-minute saline wash. So this might be what a nurse does. Washes a wound for a minute, and it doesn't really clean it out. In fact, often you see more under the microscope because it liberates the stuff from the crevices. That's what you get in one minute of star stream, two minutes of star stream. So it's good for cleaning wounds. Let's get rid of the dead and think about humans and life. Now, we, you know, got to say we're not on living humans yet. But it turns out you can buy human skin, and if you feed it, you can keep it alive. When I say you, I mean the monsters who work for me. <laughs> <laughs> So, this is a different device, Star Healer. So the idea is, this is your uh, skin, that's the, that's the, this is the epidermis layer on the top, and it uh, protects you, and underneath there's a red saw bit, the, the dermis underneath. And if you rip it off, what happens is you, signals are sent. The, you know, the skin knows it's been injured, it's, it's felt a shear as you, as you rip the skin off. It, it gets extra oxygen, all sorts of, I don't really know, none of us really know, but some signals are sent downwards, and that causes repair to travel upwards. And so what we're trying to do is say, let's excite bubbles to give farm, to enhance this signal so that we don't just clean wounds, but we, we make the, the, repair, the repair mechanisms in the body, we kick them into overdrive. So you grow that skin very, very fast over the wound. Because if you can do that, remember, skin protects you from infection. It's been doing it for about, I don't know, 200,000 years. This is before antibiotics, this was what you had, your skin. So that was the idea. So and this is important. In the NHS, each year, um, there's about 800, uh, 0.8 billion pounds is spent on 7,000 amputations, just in diabetics alone, of people who've got wounds that we cannot clean. Nothing can be done to clean them, and so they lose. And then you add the cost of the people who've got wounds from burns and all sorts of other accidents, road traffic accidents, all these wounds. Uh, and so we thought, let's see if we can clean that. Now, at this point, I was go I'm going to show a wound. Honestly, most of you will want to clo close your eyes. I promise you. So this is shut your eyes now, unless you're extremely brave. And that goes for any viewers on YouTube. I'm going to briefly show the kind of wound we're going to treat. OK, three, two, one. There it is. It's quite nasty. Um, so this is what we did. We took um, this wound, this skin that you can buy, human skin, living in a petri dish, because we have to do petri dish tests before we, before we move on to people. And you can see the skin has been ripped off here. 
That's the uh, top layer of the skin. And, and what's been left here is the, um, the saw bit underneath. Now, we know, um, we know we can clean wounds, and that would help people get better. But can we do something else? Can we tr dis quite apart from cleaning, can we just trigger the healing mechanism of the body using, remember, water, sound, and air, no chemicals, unless you add, include the set salt in the saline. So that's all we want to do. Now, so we, keep, we wound these and keep them clean. We don't let them get infected because we don't want to include in there the cleaning benefit of removing the infection. We want to see, can we take a clean wound and trigger it to heal? So um, that's seven days after wounding, and you can see... This has started thickening here as some of these cells perhaps have migrated up to the surface and tried to regrow the skin. There you go. And that's if we, after wounding, we wash it for two minutes in saline and wait seven days. You can see a little bit of healing there. Now what we're going to do is exactly... This saline wash came through the device without ultrasound on the Star Healy device. Now we're going to wash the same thing as this. Two minutes, wash in saline after wounding, but the wounding, but the wash comes to them a uh, star healer, so it's got ultrasound in. And then we wait seven days, and you can see the skin growth. So that's regrowing your skin using just sound, air, and water to provide that protective cover that will, we hope, benefit burns, benefit chronic wounds, uh, and prevent you from getting further infection. So we talked about the NHS, but we're also interested, there's a bigger world than the NHS out there. So uh, Men Yang and I went out to rural Ghana here, where uh, the biggest cause of death, well, the biggest cause of death in, you know, some countries is, is heart attacks, strokes, cancer, uh, road traffic accidents. Here it's infection. It's just infection. Um, and so we found a wonderful group in Navrongo who, um, and are talking to them about introducing our devices uh, to an area to look at the, um, uh, to use after, uh, after, after kids are born and the umbilical cord is severed. Because um, uh, your, your chances of, of dying there are um, uh, dying before 28 to 6%. And that's, that's not 28 years, that's 28 days after birth. And of course that then feeds in, that shapes everybody's life with misery, with, with limiting what they can do. So what we wanted to do is try and say, okay, can we, can we go in there and take one area and equip it with star healers and see how it fares compared to other areas? Uh, we don't have the money to do that yet, but we're looking for it. And uh, this, is the, uh, this would be the area that we would, this, this is the kind of, this is a compound inside of which are a lot of motorbikes. And nurses get given these motorbikes with healthcare kits on the back and they go out and then they find people who've had births or injuries or burns or illness and they treat them. And we want to try and make these star healer devices run from a motorbike battery because then we can give one to each nurse and they can go off. And we can treat all those births and see if it makes a difference and get the survival rate up. So another development then is Star Saver. But here's a gentleman, he's had an acid attack and he's, having the, uh, he's being cleaned by the fireman. Uh, here's a mountain climber. He would carry a bottle of water like this because you don't want to get thirsty. And if he finds somebody who's injured, he could give him a drink from the bottle of water and that would make that person um, rehydrated, save their life. But if, they, if that person that the mountain climber finds has got a gash or a nasty injury, he can back, patch it up, ship him to hospital, and by the time he gets to hospital three hours later, he might have sepsis might have set in. And your chance of dying of sepsis, I think, increases about 6% every hour once it's set in. And the doctors, by law, have to give an effective treatment as soon as they see it, but they don't even know what causes it. You can get sepsis. It, suppose they give a really powerful antibiotic. The sepsis could be caused by bacteria. It could be caused by a fungus or a virus. And that, so that treatment could be ineffective. So what I'm saying is, could we make this a star healer? So what we do is we take every single it's a concept. We take every single bottle of water and we give people a solar-powered battery nozzle and turn every bottle of water for every army medic, every mountain climber, every ambulance man, every person working in a low-middle-income country in maternity ward, make it a star healer. Okay, so it works by using 
air, sound, and water. There are reasons for not using antimicrobials, antibacterial things. And one is skin has friendly bacteria. You're used to knowing that the gut has friendly bacteria, but the skin is, I don't know, 50% bacteria. And if you use antibacterials on it, you, you damage the skin and make it more prone to further infection. So uh, you might like your thing that just washes rather simply. Centre for Disease Control recommends hands be washed for 20 seconds in warm, soapy water. In the UK, the average is six seconds, often in cold water, and that's just the women. The men never wash their hands. <laughs> so it, we know that this technology works well for washing hands. Here's a star stream cleaning the hands, and we flick the switch, and it works quite well here. This is a high-speed movie, and you can see when the sound is off, the bubbles are cleaning in the fingerprint. Sound on, they st off, stop. Turn the sound on, they start cleaning again. Turn the sound off, and they, st and they stop. Turn the sound on. On, there you go, and they clean. And so they keep cleaning like that. So uh, the second reason for not using antimicrobials is because of the threat of antimicrobial resistance. And this is that um, it's co commonly uh, misunderstood. People think that this is them becoming resistant to antibiotics. So if they never take an antibiotic, it's all right. It'll work for them when it's needed. It's not true. It's not what it is. It's about the world out there, the fields, the water supplies, getting dilute concentrations of, anti of, of antibiotics and antifungals and antivirals. And so working on... And that then develops a, a, natural, uh, a natural resistance out there so that it doesn't matter whether you don't take it or not the bugs out there will develop to become resistant to the drugs we would use against them. Unless a solution is found, by 2050, antimicrobial resistance will cost the global economy more than the current size global economy and be killing more people than cancer. So it's a serious position. And there's a, there is a number of ways, the, the most important word in that sentence is unless, because I think when many people hear this phrase, they say, yeah, but, you know what, let's be optimistic. That unless means that researchers will find something and drug companies will translate it cost-effectively to 7 billion people and their animals in a manner that will allow ready uptake to buy culture, infrastructure, you know, there are no fridges to keep the drugs cold, training, behaviour, religion, of course, people get, keep cattle next to water supplies, migration, black market, and the fact that racehorses can cost 100 million, so someone will cheat. And then... People will keep rolling them out because if we find a new antibiotic, it'll only buy us 10 more years and we'll shift that 2050 to 2060. And the other way is a pessimism. We must find alternatives to antibiotics. If you look at this map, which is a colour map, the hot colours are the number of samples that were of, of Streptococcus pneumoniae, which were um, antibiotic resistant to this class, erythromycin. And that was 2009, I think, and go to 2015 gets redder, and that's just because these things travel and spread. The time may come when penicillin can be bought by anyone in the shops. Then there's a danger the ignorant man may easily underdose himself, and by exposing his microbes to non-lethal quantities of drug, make them resistant. That was said by Fleming when he got his Nobel Prize for discovering penicillin. And we didn't heed the warning. We kept going for 70 years, taking these things like Smarties. And this is about behavior. So effective technology, this is my closing point, must take account of behaviour. Say, so if we put drugs on our hands, we eat them, they will make their way in dilute form to the water supply, where a natural resistance will, a natural selection will occur. The weak bugs will be killed off, the, uh, the uh, stronger ones will survive, and so you will change the makeup, the genetic makeup out there, so more of the bugs are resistant. So the next time you get infected, resistant. And this is because we're sending out there in the wider world dilute forms of our drugs. But if we look at the technology I was talking about, it's only sound, air and water. That's all it is. And it only works when the three are together. So by the time it goes out into the water supply, it isn't, isn't a problem. So we try to educate. It's about behaviour here. So if I want to get this technology accepted at large, it's about altering behaviour. So we tried a number of ways of doing that. And one thing is this organisation which... Um, I, I, I set up, and I, I love, it's a 200 or more now people from different disciplines working together, and you can see a big batch of them there, working together, all bringing their different skills. And one thing that we came up with is the most dangerous game in the world. It's, here it is. It's a big old TARDIS made of wood. It lives permanently at the, um, 
Winchester Science Centre. Here it is at the Science Museum here. And people go around, they play five games, and at the end, they've got an old-fashioned typewriter and they make a promise. And we took this to the Cheltenham Science Festival, where, the f for the morning, the children came in. Now, the children only understood one of the promises, so we only talked to them about one promise, and that was when they wash their hands, they wash it for twice. Happy birthday to you. Sing it twice. After the morning, the kids left, the adults came in, so we could turn on the video cameras, and the very first thing that happened was this woman said this. Okay. Well, I was in the toilet earlier on, and then I heard some few kids uh, that were singing happy birthday. I didn't know why, and now I know. Yeah. Thank you. And it from here, basically. Thank so you. For that, for that day, that morning, we changed behaviour in children when it came to hand washing. Now, the second reason, uh, the second way that in NAMRIT we, we worked to, um, to try and uh, investigate behaviour is uh, we funded a number of projects and commissioned and funded, and one of them was called These in Our Hands, and the people uh, who worked on it are down at the bottom there. And what that was, we got a guy who did animal personations and some geographers, because they're very good at looking at behaviours, and they talked to some... Uh, uh, microbiologists about how sticky bugs were and then we they talked to some engineers and some um, chemists and they made things that sticky and then we bought some mannequins shop mannequins three of them and we dosed them up so uh, we had three different bugs three three different sticky bugs they weren't really bugs they were safe um, different colors uh, one for each different disease um, e coli I don't know pseudomonas MRSA something like that put them in a ward, dosed it properly, and invited the nurses to come in and treat them. And these were good nurses, so they did. And they did wonderful things. Uh, the only thing was, these, were invisible, these bugs were invisible, these, these pastes and things were invisible to the nurses, but they were visible to our cameras in ultraviolet. So we could watch how they spread. And you can see that behaviours that nurses do that are good are, can spread. So, for example, if you take the stethoscope, you, you put it on the skin. That puts bugs onto the stethoscope. If you take the temperature as you're supposed to, you put a thermometer in the mouth. But nurses, these nurses were caring, even to these mannequins. So they did more than that. From time to time, more frequently, they'd roll back their glove and put it on the patient's forehead. Check the temperature, roll the glove back. And so things spread. So we have all this data, which is now with the signal process, that we're now using to inform the, uh, uh, the health service what behaviours spread bugs in nurses. But as well as that, we thought we could make something beautiful of this. So we made a, um, a, a video, which I'll show you now, from all the clippings of what we did, and that's what I'll close with. So here's the video that we, uh, we distribute to hospitals, and it really just summarises this multidisciplinary collaboration, thinking in a new way about infection prevention. These are the hands that touch us first. Feel your head, find the pulse, and make your bed. These are the hands that tap your back, test the skin, hold your arm, wheel the bin, change the bulb, fix the drip, pour the jug, replace your hip. These are the hands that fill the bath, mop the floor, flick the switch, soothe the soil, burn the swabs, give us a jab, throw out sharps, design the lamp. And these are the hands that stop the leaks, empty the pan, wipe the pipes, carry the can, clamp the veins, make the cast, log the dose, and touch us last.
Thank you very much. very much for a wonderful lecture. Um, we do have a little bit of time if there are some questions. Um, I certainly thought you answered more questions uh, than I could have possibly asked, but there, there are probably also more questions that have been raised. Um, yeah. Could we have a microphone over there? Hello, thank you for that wonderful uh, talk. Um, the thing that suddenly occurred to me was, can you not incorporate these devices into just um, hand-washing taps so that you can use them all the time, or would the cost be prohibitive at the moment? No, you could. Um, and uh, I wouldn't say that's out of the realms of possibility at all. Uh, th this is our new company. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> There's very little I can say, but ex you're exactly right, you, 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 without just, a doubt. And, and the, the other thing about taps, of course, is that part of the problem with the new technology and getting it adopted is behaviour. If you have to train people, if people have to change their behaviour, then it creates a problem for adoption. But, for example, in the, in the trial, the NHS pilot of cleaning instruments, what happens is after the instrument has been used, the nurse rinses it under a tap, gets rid of something, and then it goes off to sterile services to be, you know, heat treated and such like. So if we place that tap with our tap, the nurse does exactly the same thing and knows no difference. So we don't have to go into invest any investment at all in retraining the nurse to use a fancy new machine. So that is one of the, I think that's, a, that's one of the key elements that's perhaps underlooked with new innovations and new technologies. I think uh, people want something with a different looking box because they want, because a lot of, every, a lot of things are out there. So people take a, a variation on a theme, put it in a different looking box, and they think they've got something great. I think my philosophy is a little different. Take what people already do, make it look the same, but completely revolutionize it, what it does. Uh, and that way, it's much more easy to adopt. Is there any downside in, in, in the device? Would it sort of make your hands sore if you used it too much? Or? We haven't found that, no. no. And again, we've, we, we, uh, we are progressing towards human trials and human tests. We've done some human tests on hand washing, and it's been good at removing bugs from hands. We haven't, we've used bugs that are very similar to Pseudomonas and MRSA. I think is that, no, no, it wasn't. It's C. difficile an MRSA we've used. And it's good at cleaning them, and people haven't reported any hand problems. We've taken the uh, pieces of um, living human skin that, that my monsters grow uh, <laughs> and feed, and, and looked at that under a microscope, and there's no damage to that. So, uh, you know, it's, it's a question of progressing. Um, uh, but it isn't, it isn't, I say, it's air, sound, water. There isn't a chemical involved. Thank you very much. Question in the back, and then another one here. So. Thank you very much. Uh, great lecture. I, I was just looking at the bubbles you were looking at with, with the um, different fish interacting with the bubbles. If that was a salt water environment, will it be different from a freshwater environment? Just looking at that. That's a good question. No, it, it's pretty much the same. In fact, these, the sonar technologies were all tested out at sea. So we did that in the, the pictures I gave you of the orange and black scans, they were done in a test tank within two meters, but this has now been taken out to sea and tested at sea. Um, the presence of salt doesn't affect the acoustics so much. It does affect the number of bubbles. You tend to get in salt water a lot more bubbles and a lot, and they're much smaller. So you have to take that into account in your acoustics. But um, it, it still works out in salt water. There was a question here, um, and maybe another question later on here. Hi, um, with the bubble technology, is there a potential application as well for cleaning wastewater? So I guess cleaning itself. I guess your water. Sorry, with the. 
uh, with the star technology and yes. the bubbles? Um, it's, a, it's a different issue. Again, we've had projects looking at that um, in the early days. People here are laughing in the second row because they know you can't talk about this, you can't talk about that. <laughs> <laughs> and when I say we, I mean somebody else who uh, is just, you know, in my team. So, I, I, you know, I, you've got to... Yes, it's, it, has been the, it has been the project of another member of my team. However, that member of my team had a lot more to do with it than I did. Um, and so it's, I think it's, it, it it's contains, it, it, it's, a diff, it's a different problem in a way, um, and I think it isn't, in a way, I want to work, you know, I've only got so much time, and I've only got so much money, and I want to work where I make a big difference. Now, there are plenty of ways of cleaning up wastewater, and somebody else can use another technology. There's no way of growing skin fast. There's nothing out there. There's nothing you can do. So I think we want to focus on the things that where it makes a game changer. Um, and that's what we'll do first. Because we've got limited time and limited resources. I think there was a question here. Um, thank you for the lecture. Um, what previous research um, gave you the idea to use um, sonar um, to manipulate water? And uh, yeah, what, what gave you this? the inspiration to use it um, in sanitation? That's a good a question. Um, let me think now. So I wa when I was 16, 17, or 18, I was at university, I was an undergraduate and looking for a research project. I'd done theoretical physics and physics, and plenty of that, and I was doing cosmology and astrophysics, and I really wanted something that made my hands get wet, something physical that could get. Um, and so I, I started working, at, I tried to look into the question of why brooks and streams brabble, which it turns out had been answered anyway in 1933 by a clever chap called Minot. But I was, I was young and foolish in those days. Um, so that then got me interested in uh, how sound and bubbles react under water. So I looked at baby scans and other things. And then the key that got me on the road for this was I was sending two signals, sound signals at a bubble, and I saw another signal given off that had never been seen before. And that fascinated me. And it turns out it's the sound of stimulating those ripples and picking up a sound to do with them. Um, and so then that got me interested in uh, one strand, which was working out the theory of how those ripples could form. Another strand that was to do with um, using that to measure bubbles in the ocean, uh, and another strand to do with um, working out, um, teaming up with chemists to work out how that would mix up the liquid nearby. And then when I, it put, it's putting all those three strands together that eventually produces um, uh, a piece of kit. So in the long, you know, that, you wouldn't have planned it. <laughs> <laughs> I think there was one question here, and um, that will be our last question then, yeah? Uh, thank you. Yeah, thanks a lot, Tim. What, what, do you, what have you found to be the biggest challenge in translating science into application in the marketplace, and, and what would be the solution to those sorts of challenges? That's a really good question. Um, If you think you've got something that can really help with society, uh, do something, be a product, something like that, uh, there is no point publishing it and saying, there you go, someone could use this to make cancer. I mean, I think the most damning thing I ever read when I see people writing about themselves is, this could, this could, and what they say is, this could sort dementia, this could reduce, and what people do is they publish it up there and they, they say, okay, I'm throwing a ball, I want you, someone out there to catch it, don't bother me. It's could, and it's a promise people make to get funding and things. And you can't throw a ball because no one will catch it for two reasons. No one will spot your work. Um, many journal papers that are published are read by six people, and that's it. Um, and the other thing is, why would a manufacturer take your idea and build it? Because it'll take, perhaps to make a product, they've got a, it's going to take them 10 years, they're going to have to build a factory, they're going to have to close down their similar product line, um, all through those 10 years, they'll be paying wages, they'll build something, they'll sell it at a high price because they've got 10 years worth of debt to pay off, and immediately someone else will buy it, copy it, and sell it at half the price. 
They won't do, so no one will build it unless you have protected it, which usually means patenting it. So I think planning to patent and to meet up and partner with people who will take your vision and help you put it to society is huge. And I think finding those people is great. I must have been approached by 50 venture capitalists coming to me and saying, this is a great idea, the Starstream. Uh, tell you what, we'll both form a spin-out company. We'll form a spin-out company. You own half, we own half. We'll tell everyone it's worth a million. And then you do your thing. You talk. People believe you. And after a couple of years, we'll say it's worth 10 million. Does somebody want to put another 10 million in? to own 50%. Now, my share's just gone down to 25%, but it's, 10, it's 25% of a real 10 million that wasn't there before, because there's no money there before. And we do this a few times, and then at some point, me and the guy who was in it first, we sell and get out. And nobody's built anything. No young people have been employed to build anything. And that's a model. That was about 50 people. So when you've got a good idea and you've paid for a patent, and somebody comes to you and says, I want to invest in that, that can be the death of it. So in fact, I, I, I really, it's finding people who have your vision to build toys and change society and benefit people, not to make the money, not to make the quick buck. That's the key. So I think planning, protecting your work, um, being discriminating about whose money you take and putting the effort in uh, to do it. And there, there is very little funding for this. It's really hard. Uh, you can get research grants through the first bit of research, and then there's what is called, and you'll have heard the phrase, valley of death. In between, it was a good idea, it seems to work, until a product, nobody wants to invest in it, um, because it might go nowhere. And getting over the valley of death, um, I think this, is, um, I, this has been the hardest thing I've ever done, trying to get that star stream from a kind of, it works on a bench, through to, we can build them, We've got a company. I think it's about the hardest thing I've ever done. Um, and it didn't require invention. It just required perseverance and you know, discrimination um, and keeping going. And so I think that was the harder thing. I think it's problematic all along the way. Um, and I'm not surprised that we see many things that we hear the word could many times, and we never see the fruit of that could. So one last question and... Uh... Thank you for the lecture. Um, with the star healer, uh, you were saying that after seven days, the skin was recovering quite quickly. I'm just wondering, if you treated it more frequently, does that increase the rate of healing? We, uh, we haven't done those tests. And if you ask me to speculate, I've got no idea. I've got a team here that know this. <laughs> uh, it, it's quite interesting. My, my last two recruits for engineering PhDs are both here. One's a microbiologist and one's a medic. Um, because I'm sh the, that multidisciplinarity is key. You, you know, you've got to, and, and so you've got to construct a team that work well together, but which cover the bases. Uh, and that's what I'm and to, hugely fortunate to have, is a multidisciplinary team who's, who were named on the last slide. Um, and, and you ask me a question like that, and I'm not going to even try to be the expert in how wounds heal. Um, these guys are. Okay, thank you very much. Um, before uh, I ask you to uh, thought again, uh, I said at the beginning, this is not just a lecture, but actually a price lecture. Uh, the uh, Clifford Patterson uh, lecture comes with a price of 2,000 pounds, and I think the check is already in the post. Um, <laughs> but uh, it also comes um, with a medal and a certificate, and I'm very pleased to Thanks present very you much. both. <laughs> Thank, you, uh, Thank you. Thank you very much.